So I'm going to finish up our communication network and avoidance as a means of uh, reducing depredation for our fleet. Ideally, what our fleet would really like is a, um, a network of acoustical, I guess an acoustical array, like a fence, out in front of Sitka that would tell them where whales are coming and going from along the shelf edge. But this is the next best thing right here, as is what Jeff will talk about a little bit later today. So again, here's C-Swap, all the players. So these questions to address, are these the same whales? Wait, I actually need to jump down to the, because I put two presentations in one, so this is our first one. So I need to get down to the, so where I ended, where I ended it, the last one. So should I just zip through there? There's a way to bring it a screen and, and just bring it down. Sorry about that, I forgot that I needed to be queued up where I ended it, my last talk. Right there, yeah. Thank you. So now that we've established the fact that whales can be predicted to be in a certain place at a certain time, we have developed the real-time network where we are in the process of developing this real-time network. And this is our website. I really haven't brought that up before. It's cswap.info, and a lot of this information that we've been talking about today is on this really beautiful website that was developed by a very young, innovative website designer. It's www.cswap.info. And these are our primary repeat depredators. And the results of the tagging, as we talked about, they circumnavigated Baranoff Island, and they spent a lot of time in Chatham, but also outside Chatham. We haven't had a lot of these, these depredating whales tagged yet, and that's a, we're right now in the first year of a, of a two-year funding cycle, and this next year we'll be really targeting these specific whales, either an outside and inside. We don't exactly know how often they move inside, from the outside waters to the inside waters as well. But we started in the inside waters of Chatham because it was really doable, it was contained. And the fishermen that fish in this area, they have the same amount of quota. Everybody has the same piece of the pie, but they fish it so differently. Some guys go in there and just, they just fish one set and then they leave and they just take the consequences if they go over. And other guys piece it out so it takes them maybe three or five sets to get the same amount of the quota, so they all do it differently. So, and this is reflected in some of this data. So we divided up our areas, our offshore waters and our inside waters by these, um, in these blocked categories. So we also can't give out any information where fishing vessels are fishing. So everything is, is kind of crypted into areas and um, kind of uh, coded boats. So you won't see any names of boats here. So we have 79 permit holders total in Chatham. Now we're just talking about the state fishery in the inside waters. And that's that narrow band over there, the 10 to 11, 12 down there. So that's the fleet, that's part of the fleet that we're working with. The, the, the um, fishermen that fish outside, that's the federal survey. Those are the federal, man, man, well actually it's managed by, it's a, it's a state, anyway, I'm, and maybe Megan can explain this, but, or Jeff can, but there's an overlap between the state and the federal fisheries, and they work really closely together. And we're kind of stuck in the middle there. So there's 79 per total permit holders and 54 vessels. And why do we have more permit holders than vessels? Well, these guys can fish on other people's vessels. So if you're a permit holder and you want to fish your quota, you can jump on and pay somebody to use their boat and all their equipment, basically, to fish your quota. And there's a lot of guys that do this. So especially if it's a little tiny bit of, bit of the pie. Also, it's fishing is such a social network. I almost believe we need a social scientist in this project because there's a group of, of there's a town called Petersburg, and it's uh, settled by Norwegians, it's almost all Norwegians, and they all fish together, like together in an amoeba, they say in part of the year, I finally figured this out, so they do everything together, and then they come and sweep up the, their, their quotas and chat them, and then they go duck hunting, and they all do this together, like in a group, so I finally got Petersburg figured out. Um, so there's that part of the fishing community that also is a really added benefit to understanding that, so that can help you inform what they're doing with their fishing as well. So. So we ended up with 48 permit holders representing 34 vessels for this study. Those are the vessels, those are the skippers that decided to join our project to test this network. 
That's 63% of the active fleet. In our, in our grant, we said we would at least get about a third of the fleet, so we feel really good about that. And we had 117 reports from 28 vessels over the season. And they had visual, 13 visual reports. And only three vessels had any catch removed from the gear by the sperm whales. So this sounds like a really high number, 91% of the participating vessels successfully avoided de depredation, woohoo, but that really isn't the real story. I mean, that is true, that fact is true, but there's a lot of reasons behind the reason that it's so high. So, I can't really see that total, but, um, so this is some of the whale activity. So the red circles are the hot spots where a lot of fish were caught, and the, there were two whales in Chatham at this time. And so, and you can see the, um, so you can see the whale blue and um, blue and black whale pictures are right there. You see right there. So that's wh that's where the whales were, and this is primarily where they were fishing, right here, all the way up there. Some guy was fishing up there and got some fish, and uh, so these the red circles are where they were, they were the most the I guess the densest fishing the ground. Most of the fish were caught right in those areas. You can see those aren't necessarily where the whales were. So, again, here's this hot spot right there. Whales are down there. So this network is, the fishermen have a full participation in this. They need, so this is, again, the serial depredators. I'm gonna get to the, where it explains the network. Actually, it's not in here. I'm not sure where the slide is for the network, but I'll describe it. Um, we can look at Sitco over and describing it. So the network is they're giving these in-reach devices, and these in-reach devices are um, their location. So it's like a GPS, and they can punch in. We coded it so they can punch in. Yes, I have sperm whales. No, I don't have sperm whales. And they're supposed to call in twice a day, and so every day we are supposed to get reports from all of our fleet. They would say yes, I have sperm whales, and no, I don't. And what happened was is that the fishermen, when they didn't have whales, they had no need to call us. So they didn't call us. And some of the fishermen were really wary of the inReach device. So this was our first year in dealing with these inReach devices. So then we let them use their cell phones or their satellite phones. So now we've widened it out, so they're all going to be able to use whatever they want to call us. But, but that takes a, something away a little bit from our project because the inReach was nice and consistent and it called, um, and it called everybody, and if you wanted to send out a message, everybody got the same message. And now it's a little bit more work on our part. So that's the communication network. Every day they're supposed to give us reports of where they are and what they're seeing in terms of whales and where they're fishing. And then we also went out at the, the, right when the season started to satellite tag whales. So our part of it was is that we were going to have the whales tagged, and then we were going to provide real-time reporting to the fishermen. And um, we had a couple issues, and it, it will work if we can get more whales that, <laughs> to be tagged. We had those, th those whales I talked about this morning, those same whales were in there, and we could get one tag on. It was perfect conditions, perfect weather, but these whales are very wary of us, and we could only get one tag on, so, which was good, and, and that la tag actually lasted quite a while, into way after the fishing season ended. And the whale ended up, that's the one that went, circled around Baranoff and Chichikov Island. It did, and then it ended up, its transmissions, by going into the north end of Canada, on Haida Gwaii Island, or, or um, Queen Charlotte Islands, in 50 feet of water, and that's where it stopped transmitting. We have no idea what that whale's about, what he was really doing, but, and, his, and whether or not his buddies were with him because we couldn't satellite tag both whales at once. So these are some of the problems that we're having with that we, some of the kinks, I guess, we need to work out in this process. So, but, it, um, but overall, we did collect an amazing amount of data for a very short time period because we just started this project last in mid-August when the fishing season opened. Um, and our lessons learned are, um, what we learned is that the whales traveled freely in and out of Chatham Strait. They were there, and then they weren't, and then they came in. Sometimes they were right on the vessels, and sometimes they just, the vessels were there, and they just totally ignored the vessels. Um, they were, spent a lot of time in really shallow water in the inside part of Chatham than we expected, 
and they went way up north, and we have no idea. There's no fishing that happens way up north Chatham, and they were just up there, basically right off this, the community of Juneau. So we're learning a lot about the sperm whale behavior and what they're up to, and it not always is, um, it doesn't always just jive exactly with what we were thinking about in terms of depredation. The fishermen themselves were all over the map in terms of their behavior as well. So basically we had sperm whales kind of going all over the directions and then the fishermen were doing the same thing. Five boats would leave Petersburg, which is on the way in the inside, intending, or the statement would be, they were intending to fish their quota in Chatham. One vessel would end up fishing at that point in time. We expected five, we were trying to plan our surveys, but we couldn't do it because the four vessels that said they were gonna fish Chatham, for whatever reason, you know, fishermen are independent, they just had something else to do and they went and did whatever else they were gonna do rather than come and chat them. So there's some difficulties with the network, but I really think it holds a lot of promise because, because if you can work really closely with your fleet and really have good communication, everybody will benefit. So I think the end result will, will be, in the end, will work out some of these details. So as long as we get a social scientist on board to make us all understand what we're all talking about so we speak the same language. So, and, uh, that's our network.